Hi everyone, I'm Jennifer Hancock and this is the International Humanistic Management Association's Lunch and Learn for August uh, 2020. Uh, my co-host is Elizabeth Castillo. Elizabeth, say hi. Hi everyone, very nice to meet you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Our guest today is Anka Vinchenbach. Uh, she is the ER ESRC funded PhD researcher and teaching fellow in the School of Hospitality and Tourism Management at the University of Surrey, UK. Her research focuses on understanding livelihood diversification from fishing into tourism into, in coastal communities in the UK. Utilizing dignity as the guiding concept, the project explores how people experience and understand their lives in relationship to their work in times of social change and declining natural resources. A first output of her research she recently published, Rethinking Decent Work, The Value of Dignity in Tourism Employment in the Journal of Sustainable Tourism. And that's why we asked her to join us today. She's also one of the IMA 2019-2020 uh, fellows. Uh, but we wanted to talk about um, the value of dignity in employment um, as a lunch and learn topic. Welcome, Anka. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jennifer and Elizabeth for inviting me yeah and i'm i'm very thankful to be able to share um some of my work um with a with a very engaged audience and um yeah as you said um i'm working at the university of surrey i'm also doing my phd there in the um in the presentation today i'm focusing mainly on the broader concept of dignity at work so i'm not talking about fisheries even though that is one of my research topics um, but I'm going to focus on um, dignified work in the concept or in the context of tourism employment. Um, and I'm very, yeah, excited to share share my research. And I'm also looking forward to your questions. Great. Well, go ahead and uh, let's get started. Cool. I'm sharing my screen now, and you let me know if you can see my screen. There it is. There it is, yeah, yep. I'm just making bigger. Okay, cool. So, um, yeah, so this, this work is based on um, a paper I published um, two years ago now with my both first and second supervisor for my PhD. And it basically, this um, paper came out of my literature review for my confirmation um, report. I don't know if anyone, does that when they're doing a PhD, but we have like a, after one and a half years into a PhD, we have a um, publication. So um, called Rethinking Decent Work, um, the value of dignity in tourism employment. And it was published in the context of um, sustainable development goals with a focus on SDG 8, um, which talks about decent work. So what I'm talking about today is why am I interested in the topic of dignity? What is my relation to dignity? Um, then I'm gonna talk a bit about the context of tourism employment. Um, I would be interested if anyone in the audience is from a tourism background because um, that is obviously the specific context I'm working in. However, um, I'm hoping that what we're talking about is transferable into any other employment really. Um, then how that relates to decent work, um, conceptualizing dignity and work um, is something I'm going to share with you, um, how identity is related to it, and then I want to um, bring it all together as a psychosocial understanding of dignity that we developed in the paper. And um, just in terms of this paper, so that's my first um, ever published academic paper. Um, so quite, quite proud of it in a, in a three-star journal. So that's been um, a huge, huge recognition of my work already. Um, and it's um, already quite well cited. So that's great to see so much engagement with it. Um, and I hope you find that valuable too. Um, but I'm also want to want to give you some practical tips of what dignity um, at work looks like. So why dignity? What, wh when I started researching dignity, a lot of people said, like, yeah, but it's um, an obvious concept. concept. Um, you know, we all talk about dignity all the time, but I kept saying like, but what does it mean? And like actually, um, yeah, looking at 
at organizations talking about dignity, um, they, they talk about it a lot. For example, um, the Economy for the Common Good, which I'm also an active member of, they have um, four core values and they are talking about human dignity. They're talking about human dignity in the context of employment. Um, and for example, here in the matrix, um, C1 talks about human dignity in the workplace and working environment. Um, however, they don't really say what dignity is. Um, and, um, but that kind of the economy for the common good really triggered my initial interest in dignity. And so did the um, Humanistic Management Association, who has part of their vision, we envisage, uh, we envisage envision a society and an economy that works for all such a society promotes organization or, uh, organizing practices that honors the inherent value of all life and protects human dignity so dignity has been mentioned a lot um, but it has been um, conceptualized in different ways so i'm trying to shed light on tourism in tourism employment particularly so why am I interested in tourism employment? My background is tourism. So I'm in the Department of Tourism, um, but I also worked in tourism for more than 20 years. So I come from a practitioner background, worked in travel agencies all my life before I ventured into the academic world. Um, so tourism employment is a fantastic area because it gives lots of opportunities for women, migrants and young people. So it's quite open, quite enabling um, environment. Um, it's great for people who are maybe less skilled, for example, in developing economies as well. Um, it gives people new knowledge and skills. People talk about how amazing it is to be internationally connected, meeting new people. Um, so lots of positive things to say about tourism employment. However, it really has a dark side of tourism employment and, um, and that is unsustainable. When we're talking about sustainable development, um, low wages, low skilled work, and there's nothing wrong obviously with giving opportunities to people who are low skilled, but often they remain in these low skilled jobs. There's often no opportunities or limited opportunities for progression. Um, there's lots of, um, um, exploitation in terms of um, gender or, or race or religious background so it's a really challenging industry um, and there's limited studies on that but employees um, do often feel undervalued and under un, unappreciated yeah often tourism works also, also has a low prestige so when you say i'm a waiter for many people that is a job rather than actually a career um, so lots of challenges um, and related to that, one of the questions that was submitted before this presentation was, for example, um, how do we measure, how do we measure that? How can an organization put a value on that? And I wanted to share statistics here. So in the UK alone, the cost of labor turnover is massive. Yeah. So because people leaving tourism employment because it is for them unsustainable yeah so that you can put a monetary value on that which has been um, done quite a bit so that's an, an interesting area to look at um, another question people um, said like how does it look like in terms of um, COVID-19 and there has been um, a lot of positive to report about how people got back into tourism employment how for example um, domestic tourism picks up at the moment, so lots of opportunities. However, here's an example of a hotel in Scotland, um, which at the beginning of lockdown in the UK, that was in um, end of March, um, sacked their staff from one day to another, yeah, without any warning. So they made all their um, staff unemployed. Um, and not only that, but also homeless. So from one day to another, they asked them to leave their accommodation and that um, what followed was a huge media outcry um, and um, they then kind of did a bit of a u-turn saying it was an admin error but here's an example on the left side um, of the letter that they sent to their staff and um, that doesn't sound like an admin error really so it's been um, a real shocker and a real example of how 
unsecure their employment is. People often don't have proper contracts. People um, are left alone. And what was interesting about this example, um, in this remote community in Scotland, um, local people actually um, immediately offer not only accommodation, but also employment to people who have been laid off. So that was a real power of community there, which was amazing. Um, so the problem really is, one problem, this whole topic is under-researched. So we have very, very few studies that look into the actual um, experiences of tourism employees. Um, and the other um, issue really is that the industry is largely denying um, the issues. Yeah? So the industry has to wake up to this. When we're looking at a policy context or international context, um, again, decent work um, is something that has been acknowledged, for example, in the Sustainable Development Goals, SDG 8, talks about decent work and economic growth. Um, but they really, in a tourism context, the UNWTO, which is the UN World Tourism Organization, when they talk about SDG 8, they talk about business as usual. Yeah, they talk about, they pick the economic growth bit. They don't talk about decent work. Um, so a huge denial from um, international organizations. Um, on the other hand, the International Labour Organization, um, for example, recognizes that decent work has an element of dignity, freedom and security. Um, and they also published the specific guidelines on decent work and socially responsible tourism with um, tourism specific targets that respond to the issues I showed before. So they're talking about non-discriminatory working environments, fair wages, good work life balance, um, worker involvement and social dialogue. Yeah, recognizing unions, for example, um, all of that is much more prominently recognized from the International Labour Organization. And if we're talking not only about tourism, but other industries, um, they do have specific guidelines on decent work um, for lots of other industries. It may be fisheries, it may be um, other industries. So that's a good resource for people who want to know more, saying like, how do I know if work is decent or dignified? Yeah. So. However, none of these um, does, do actually define what is dignity. Um, it's been conceptualized in a thousand different ways, and that is one of the weakness of my research, obviously, because it can only pick so many of the thousands of conceptualizations. Um, so it's complex, ambiguous, and multivalent, and we need to recognize that. So dignity might mean different things for different people, um, it's also been criticized as being a totally useless concept, meaning nothing but, nothing but respect. Um, so it's not only that everybody recognizes dignity as important, but there's also people who say it is actually a concept that means nothing. Um, and I would like to challenge that because it does mean a lot. So when we're looking at dignity at work, um, two books are guiding my research. That is Randy Hodson's seminal work on dignity at work from 2001 and um, Sharon Bolton's work on dimensions of dignity at work. And dignity at work broadly includes dimensions of self-respect relating to identity. Um, it's about meaning and satis meaningful and satisfying work. Yeah, feeling you're appreciated, feeling you've got a level of autonomy, um, feeling recognized and that is both in monetary terms, but also in terms of being appreciated and being recognized as an individual. Um, it's about flourishing, but it can also be uh, about class. For example, there's studies on, for example, how, for example, bin men can feel dignified in their work. So it's not, there's lots of work on, um, lots of research, for example, on um, so-called dirty work, which sometimes um, is from the outside probably perceived as how can somebody actually find that meaningful and dignified. Um, but there's a lot of people who report that actually the camaraderie and the feeling of doing something important, maybe as a cleaner or as a bin man, 
um, actually build people with dignity at work. So there's a lot about how individuals perceive um, and feel about their work, really. So it's so as a summary on dignity at work, it's both. Yeah. So it has material aspects. So which um, Sharon Bolton called dignity at work. So it's about fair wages, for example. Um, and it's about meaningful work, um, which she talked about when she talks about dignity in work. Yeah, so it's both, not one or the other. Um, and it's about establishing a sense of self-worth and self-respect. So it's about respecting yourself, but also gaining respect from others for the work you're doing. Um, and finally, so this is the um, um, basis of the um, concept we developed, um, which talks about different spheres of dignity promoting and dignity violating features of work. Yeah, so we're having um, spheres which are individual worker, so that talks about meaningful and satisfying work. Um, then we have the organizational context. Yeah, so what does my organization do in terms of equal opportunities? Do I have a contract? Do I actually feel I'm getting a fair wage? Um, am I allowed to join a union or establish a union? Um, and then there's the wider socioeconomic and policy context. So what sort of standing has my employment and my job? Do I have, um, do I feel that I'm treated equally um, in the society I'm working on, is there legislations? Um, is there actually in the country where I'm working, am I feeling protected? Is it, for example, um, illegal? Um, uh, am I legally allowed to actually join or establish a union? So what is my country actually doing about this? And what is the UN level or ILO level doing about it? So. Another thing I wanted to respond to during this talk is about people ask like, what does dignity then look like in practice? So if I'm talking at the organizational level, for example, um, I looked at best places to work in hospitality. And here's just some examples, and I don't expect you to work all of this, to read all of this, um, but some examples is, for example, people talk about how they progressed, how they were able to progress in hospitality, yeah, after, five years, um, felt I'm part of a family, for example, um, feeling they get benefits, feeling they get um, fair and constructive feedback, um, progressing through the ranks. So when you're starting as a receptionist or as a cleaner, you're not stuck in that job, but you're actually being offered more opportunities and training. So um, people who established a family and feel like they have a work-life balance. So these are examples of what dignified work looks like from people reporting back on their own experiences yeah so wherever whichever country you're joining from um if you have something like best places to work in whichever industry you're looking at looking at such quotes will give you a feeling how how people interpret their dignif dignified work um, and finally, bringing it all together and presenting um, the, the um, finding of the paper we published, it talks about a psychosocial understanding of dignity. And when we look at this module here, um, model here, we see that um, the self, the individual worker, is at the core of it. Yeah. So it's about, when we're talking about dignity at work, it's about people perceive it. There's no um no blueprint you can just um put upon people saying but your work is dignified that is not how it works it's about do i personally perceive my my work as dignified um and a lot of this has to do with identity so am i recognized as an individual with all my um all my needs or my um contacts my cultural background am i perceived as an individual um, then we have the, the organizational context um, which i showed earlier like um, does my organization enable 
that I feel valued? Does my organization recognize in monetary terms, but also in terms of feedback, um, that I, I need to feel respected? Um, and then we're talking about the wider context um, in terms of what sort of disabling or enabling factors does my, um, does my country have to international organization, organizations have. Yeah, so this, um, this is all interrelated. So none of it works in isolation. And we have examples here of different actors. So these actors move around these spheres. So it could be, for example, that how am I treated by my coworkers? There's examples of hotels, for example, where cleaners report that um, they're really the lowest um, respected in their organization and um, other people in other departments don't even talk to them because they're not perceived as equal. So these different actors play a big role on how people perceive their own dignity at work. Um, and one question that also came up, is it a cross-cultural con concept? So when we're talking about, you know, this um, economic and policy context and organizational context, so is that the same in every context? It isn't, yeah? So to some ex extent, um, it depends on the ethnic and cultural background, um, but that doesn't mean that um, there isn't a universal understanding across time, place, and different status groups. So um, the answer is, it is a cross-cultural cross concept, yes and no. Um, personally, for example, I worked um, quite a bit in an African context, um, and they have the concept of Ubuntu, for example, which is very similar um, in some respects. Um, talking about, for example, non-exploitative working conditions, having shared moral values, feeling respected um, and recognition. And ultimately, it's about humanity. Yeah, Dignity has been um, obviously well placed in human rights uh, discussions, but we all share, regardless if we are in Asia, if we're in Africa, if we're in America or if we're in Europe, um, that sense of humanity is really at the core of dignity and dignity at work. And that, um, in that respect, it is a cross-cultural concept. And um, that's from me. And um, thank you very much for listening. And I'm happy to receive any questions. So thank you so much, Anka. Um, I am going to need a copy of your slides in a PDF format so we can make sure everybody gets that because I think people have asked for it. And I was looking at it going, okay, I need to make a note of what these books are and things like that. So, um, but the question I have for you is if, if someone came to you and said, what are three things I could do to create more dignity for my employees, what would you tell them? Um, three, three areas which you could look at, for example, uh, this, this idea of dignity um, at work, for example, do I pay a fair, fair wage? That is one area, what you can do as an organization. Um, and that is, we talk in the UK about living wage. So there's a minimum wage, which is set by the government but there's um, above that minimum wage is a, a living wage, which enables, for example, for people in London to be able to pay rent. Um, yeah, so that wouldn't be able, you wouldn't be able to do that from a, from a um, minimum wage, but from a fair wage, living wage, you would be able to. So that's one thing. The other thing is having a, an open dialogue with your employees, with your staff. Um, in encouraging respect amongst your workforce, for example. So showing them respect as an employer, but also making sure people feel valued and are able to, um, yeah, able to do that to each other as well. So that, that idea of setting 
setting a moral standard for your organization? So actually Saying, valuing the people who you work with. Exactly, but well in each other as well. So one thing is you as an employer, for um, example, but also saying, okay, this is how we communicate amongst each other. Um, and the third thing is really, I would say also encouraging feedback. That's quite important. So that can be done in terms of, for example, surveys, asking people anonymously how they feel, because that is really at the core of it that people it's about personal perception, yeah? So you can have all sorts of um, regulations in place and all sorts of codes of conduct or codes of practice, but what is really important to listen to what experience people have in their day-to-day -day life at work and then addressing that, responding to that. So not only doing it as window dressing, I did a survey, but actually saying, okay, I'm gonna to respond to that and act upon the answers. Very cool. Um, so if you could stop sharing the screen, Elizabeth, do you want to start with some of the questions? Yes, um, I, we will start with um, Gerard, who has to, had to leave, but um, he wanted to know about um, the role of unions. Um, what role do you see that they play in enhancing the dignity of the worker? Um, do they help in creating decent work? Good question. Yeah, unions is a big topic in terms of um, dignity at work. So particularly Randy Hodson's work um, talks a lot about the role of unions. And um, I, I would strongly encourage looking at union work. For example, there has been a publication um, a few years back, um, which talks about unethical London from the um, from one of the biggest unions, Unite, in the UK. And they interviewed um, hotel workers in five-star hotels in London. And there were shocking results. Yeah, People are overworked, underpaid. They talk about 18-hour shifts. They don't have time to go to the toilet. They don't have time to eat. Um, people are working seven days a week without a break. And if business is slow, they get laid off from one day to the other. They feel treated like a dog. They feel like barked at from their employers. Um, so publications like that are very, very important. And unions can expose and accelerate these problems because I think that really, that report really shook the industry. Um, so I would, definitely suggest as an employer, for example, to collaborate with unions to find out what is dignified work in that particular area. So I want to follow up on that question and, um, and ask about measuring these things. Um, obviously, the minimum wage versus the living wage debate is one aspect of that. But you just talked about this survey that was done by the unions. Um, is there a way to measure dignity in the workplace? And should we be measuring dignity in the workplace or should we be measuring something else that gets at dignity? Well, that's, a, that's a, an important question. And you know, I worked in consultancy um, a couple of years and we measured everything <laughs> and we monetized everything. So I'm, I've been monetizing well-being for, um, for that consultancy firm, for the New Economics Foundation. And yes, you can monetize dignity. There is some um, approaches that have dignity scales. Um, you can measure dignity in terms of, for example, recruitment costs, staff labor turnover, staff turnover costs. You can measure it in terms of mental health, the cost of mental health, the cost of um, sick leave, for example, due to undignified working conditions. You can put a monetary value on that. And I think we should do both. I think we should actually, if organizations have the capacity to do that, look at the monetary cost and that might make a business case for businesses who are reluctant, who don't see the value in doing it. Um, but we should also have a big emphasis on the qualitative 
aspect of it, which is like, how do people feel? And that alone should give us enough information. If somebody feels like they're treated like a dog and feel like barked at, um, that doesn't need a monetary value, that doesn't need to have any scale that is undignified. So I think it, it can be a mixture of both. Okay, thank you so much. Um, the next question comes from Ariane, and Ariane, I'm gonna unmute you so that you can um, ask the question yourself. Okay, are you there? Okay, thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you also looked at um, places that are seasonal or that are local where a lot of the people in town get employed, whether that makes a difference in the turnover in how they're treated, if it's like a local um, hotel where uh, people live there um, and it's part of a community, whether that makes a difference. Um, yeah, so for example, I'm at the moment visiting in Cornwall in the southwest of England, um, which is where I did part of my research, so we're visiting at the moment, but um, the interesting bit of that is there's not many local people working in tourism. So I'm in an area here which is very, very touristic and especially at the moment um, that's high season here in August in the UK and you will find hardly any local person working in tourism or hospitality because low paid, it's seasonal, so it's not, it's not really a sustainable livelihood if you like so people are avoiding and it's not well respected as well it's seen as a holiday job for students or or people in school or off school during school holidays rather than a career so there's actually issues about attracting local workforce um yeah it probably is different in other contexts. So for example, where I'm from in Germany, a waiter would do an apprenticeship, which is two or three years, and they would be much more respected than the equivalent worker in the UK. And I can't tell you why that is, that might be a cultural thing, but um, I think it does play a role. But the, the, key, the key concern is that local people do often not choose to work in tourism because it isn't a career for them. So they might leave, which has then consequences in terms of rural flight, people leaving their communities, communities get fragmented, um, all of it plays a role. But yeah, if, if you're interested in that area, do research in this area. This is all totally under-researched, so lots of, <laughs> lots of work to do on finding okay. out more. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Can I follow up on that real quick? So the idea, it's interesting because I always hear the term sustainability in terms of the environment, but I really am liking how you're using it in terms of can this job sustain a human being, right? Uh, because that, that matters too. And it, it dawns on me that there's certain jobs that are in fact, you know, um, uh, seasonal, like fisheries are often seasonal work. So how do we maintain our fisheries and our agriculture that's seasonal and still provide those employees that are necessarily, you know, seasonal uh, with a dignified, sustainable career in whatever that field is, as opposed to the only people who could do it would be young people who haven't really started out in their career because they're the only ones who can handle a six month commitment with no no, they're there. And that would, like you said, it, it causes turnover and reduction in knowledge within the field. So thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. It, good question. Also in terms of um, primary sector employment, like farming, fisheries, for example. So again, like I'm at the intersection of tourism. So I'm, I'm looking at what happens to fishermen, for example, who transition into tourism. Yeah, they're going from one vulnerable employment into another, for example, by having the same seasonality. There is, however, areas, again, looking at Cornwall, for example, here in the UK, that has been traditionally been seasonal and people are adapting to it. So they might have traditionally more than one livelihood. So, fisher, for example, fishermen 
who mainly work during the summer, often of them they do building works during the winter and that works really well for them. So they've been traditionally um, doing two or more jobs and that is often the case in especially in rural areas where for example in tourism which is often seasonal um, which is a huge issue so the question is what do they do in the winter and I've been part of a project um, with the new economics foundation for example who try to bring in all different industries fisheries tourism renewable energies um, to look at what are different seasons for different industries. So the proposal was, for example, to say, can tourism workers support call centers for energy companies in the winter? Yeah, because these people are articulate, these people are good with clients. So would that be an option to say, these energy companies have the most calls in the winter when people need help because their heating doesn't work or their, their boiler stopped working. Um, and there is, there is started, it's starting to, to make these connections and the dream would be to give people one contract, a year round employment, which is supported by two different employers to say, you do not need to worry. Um, we want you in both industries all year round. That would be, times. yeah, that would be really cool. Well, I went to school in the, at the University of Hawaii at Manoa and an astonishing number of people work the fisheries in Alaska and then work tourism in Hawaii, right? Yeah. It's, it's absolutely astonishing how many people I knew that was their life. <laughs> you know, fisheries and in Alaska and tourism in Hawaii. So I, I, yeah, totally, I think it's a great idea. Totally acceptable from for if that's okay for the people. I think the, the question is, is that something people are enjoying doing? Is that sustainable? But we, we can't change the nature of some of the work. You know, fisheries is very weather dependent and so is tourism. So there's only so much you can do about it. You're not, the, the idea sometimes in tourism, for example, there's a lot of work going on um, on creating um, off season products. So, for example, our university just won a very big grant on that. We have three PhD students working on that topic, creating um, off-season experiences to prolong the season to give workers an opportunity to have a longer employment. So there is approaches to that, but I wouldn't say you can always do that. That doesn't make always sense. And sometimes local people and nature need a break. So there is also that aspect. Um, okay, thank you so much, Anka. Um, our next question comes from Katie. Um, Katie, I'm going to unmute you so you can ask it yourself, okay? Sure thing. Just listening to, it was a, a great presentation. It really made things in, in my in the back of my head go pretty wild, but I guess I'm not sure thank if this you. is the right, sorry, uh, I'm not sure if this is the right question for this audience, but how do you, how do you call people out on dignity violations without without an impact in them and, and, and violating their dignity and then bring that to the culture of, okay, well, we're not going to, we're not going to accept people violate another people's dignity within the organization. Super question. Um, thanks, Katie. I think it is the, the right environment for this. Um, absolutely vital to call people out on that, on dignity violations. Um, protecting people's face while doing that is super important. And I think that again, is a also part of it might be a cultural context that might be different um, in Asia than for example, in Europe. So for example, if that was a German environment, you could pretty much confront people with it, where in Asia, Asia you probably wouldn't. Um, what helps is certainly then consulting with organizations like the union to say, how do you actually have a dialogue with somebody? How do you, how do you maintain that? It's certainly important to do that on a one-to-one -one basis rather than exposing somebody um, and giving them an opportunity to rethink what, what the issue is or explain where they are coming from. So I think any, any discussion like that can only be fruitful if we're give, giving people an opportunity to talk about it um, 
like where they're coming from, what is their experience. And for example, I have a, a friend who's a junior doctor and that is very much um, this sort of, sort of notion, oh, you know, um, the senior doctors have been through this tough working environment. They have been on horrible shifts. They have been underpaid. They have been treated badly. So they pass it on to the next generation. So there's sometimes this kind of, you need to break that cycle and actually make people reflect that they need to break out of this cycle. If that is the case, where they're coming from saying, oh, you know, it toughens you up. It doesn't if it violates people's dignity. Um, so dialogue is important and that's great. Yeah. And, and that even in that conversation brought up another another thing that we've been looking into is um, the the differences between the generations and, and how maybe baby boomers treat the millennials and say, well, you know, we had it hard. They they should just toughen up and and get through it, which absolutely. And I think that that is really dangerous, actually kind of not not snapping out of that. It's um yeah, but unions, unions for sure can help also mediate that sort of um, sort of really challenging conversations. It's not easy, but great you're, great you're tackling it. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next question comes from Ken. Um, so Ken, I'm going to unmute you so you can ask it yourself. It's another question about apprenticeship. Hi, uh, this is Ken. Uh, I'm in Japan, uh, almost midnight in Japan. So here's my question about the, the UK uh, apprentice program. Last year, I've been uh, up UK to research on uh, national health system. So because so that system has been doing the uh, organization development program successfully, so when I was in the UK, I knew that there is an apprentice program for almost all uh, industry to uh, maintain the quality of uh, management or organization and, and the quality of service given by uh, workers and managers. So how, here is a question of you. So how does the apprentice program affect in, in the hospitality industry or the program that you have been uh, talking about today? So could you tell me about your uh, situation and your idea about that? Yeah, happy to respond. Thanks for joining at such a late time. Great to see you in Japan. Um, I'm, I'm personally a big fan of apprenticeships because that kind of takes that idea out of, for example, hospitality, that it's a job for the unskilled, that any of us could pick up tomorrow a tray and become a waiter. Um, so sh maybe we can do it, but there's more to it. Um, and if people want to have a career, uh, a career path opening, an apprenticeship is critically important. And that's something, for example, I, I arrived in the UK 11 years ago, um, and I was surprised that waiters don't have an apprenticeship. So in Germany, I don't know how it's in Japan, but in Germany, it's very different. If you, if you, there is that odd summer job, but generally it's a lifelong career for people where they progress through the ranks. And I think it's really encouraging that the UK is starting to establish um, apprenticeships as a recognized start for a career. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of it. And I think it's very important in any industry. It may be um, plumbing, it might be carpentry, it may be hospitality. So yeah, I think it's, it's a huge step forwards. And that also contributes to dignity in terms of being recognized and having a certification, for example, for the work you're doing. And also, I may ask you uh, about the additional question about the uh, apprentice program. If, you, if, if the apprentice program uh, gave additional 
uh, new entries from uh, different uh, business sector into hospitality uh, industry. So the number of people, uh, a number of people come to uh, the hospitality industry to receive the apprentice program and to get a, a job and get money uh, in the hospitality industry. In other words, it means uh, very competitive industry. So many You're people about uh, come to, yes, come to uh, hospitality industry because it's a, uh, it's a more easier, get, getting a job easier than any other industry. So a lot of people come to the hospitality industry and then naturally it, the industry uh, going to be competitive or more competitive than oh, other okay. industry. Yeah. Okay, um, so in that respect, um, there is a massive shortage in hospitality workforce in the UK. So we, it's, the, it's an industry which has been historically struggling, but it especially, I mean, I don't want to talk politics, but especially in the view of Brexit, um, the UK has real challenges to attract the workforce they need to keep the hospitality industry going. Um, so making it getting more entrants, especially um, entrants who are local, who are not from Eastern European countries um, or other countries, will be even more important in future because there is um, earning thresholds of people getting entry into the UK and the hospitality industry traditionally doesn't pay that um, salary that people will be recognized to be able to stay in the country. So we do need urgently more trained workers in the UK. So I, I don't see that being an issue. I don't think we're creating that sort of workforce where it becomes extremely competitive. Um, it's, I think it's quite the opposite at the moment. We urgently need more hospitality workers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, just you. real quick for everyone, um, this program was approved for HRCI and SHRM and my company, Humanist Learning Systems, will be giving out certificates of completion for everybody who wants one. So if you want one, put your name and your email and which certificates you want in the chat box. Elizabeth? Okay. Thank you. Um, so the next question comes from Terrence, and he's asked me to ask it because he's got some construction noise background. But um, he's he said, thank you for a great presentation. Um, he's interested in the effects of dignity in the workplace on overall personal health, um, especially when a person might have to be going through the complaint process at work at the same time, um, since work abuse is a, a form of violence, really. Um, can you speak to the correlation between, you know, dignity, work abuse, and uh, personal health? Yeah, um, there's um, a huge correlation. So that goes a bit back what I said before, like, if you wanted to measure dignity at work and put, put a yeah, a cost on it or a, a scale of dignity. Um, often what is used is, for example, um, absence days. Yeah, so you could actually, there's a huge correlation between mental health issues um, and absenteeism because of mental health issues, because people might perceive their work as um, violating their self-respect. Um, it also has physical effects. So people having for example, physically demanding work, which um, again, talk about hospitality, for example, that can be chefs, that can be cleaners, that people are expected to do um, work which is um, damaging their, their back, for example. So there has been, there has been really shocking um, reports in German TV. There was a reportage not long ago about um, tourism workers in Mallorca. Um, and there was, um, they had a re GP reporting on the kind of medication he's prescribing to hotel cleaners in Mallorca and the um, amount of painkillers they're using to be just able to do their work 
Um, and that is both heavy lifting, that is also the pressure they have because they have no contracts, they're on constant fear of losing their jobs. Um, that is why they also, also always need to say yes to extra hours, to overwork. Um, so there's a, a massive correlation. And I think, yeah, I think that is something that needs to be across across different industries being addressed because certainly GPs, so general practitioners or your, your doctor can definitely um, give an indication. So they should speak up. They are probably the ones who have more of a voice than the actual hospitality worker alone. Okay, yeah, sadly, you. a big correlation. Um, so that's all the questions we have right now. Um, I wonder if you have like a key takeaway for us, like, um, I have, <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm thankful for all the questions. I think it was a really, um, good debate and the key takeaway is really that I hope this presentation and this talk made clear that dignity doesn't need to be as abstract as we think it is. Yeah. So there's a way to actually, use dignity in a quite practical way to look at um, how, how does my staff feel respected? How, or who, how do I myself feel respected at work? So it could be any sort of employment to actually question that. So I hope that people found a way of seeing that it's one thing how people perceive us individually, um, but the other thing is an organization can do a lot in terms of facilitating dignified working conditions and tackling undignified working conditions by looking at the issues we discussed. So I hope it's practical as much as conceptual. So a, a question that I have that, you know, just kind of popped into my mind as you were talking about the injuries is a, a part of the hospitality industry is complicit in, in trafficking of you know, sex victims, right? So that's, to me, that's part of the dignity in work, right? <laughs> is that we've got people that are enslaved in, in, in this sort of work. Um, how, how do we help hospitality or how does hospitality help us fix that, pro that age old problem? So it's well, it's well recognized and it's a huge issue um, and that goes in the human rights direction, obviously. So there has huge legal implications. Um, but where, where that has been tackled in the past is that some of the big hotel chains have um, trained their staff on spotting um, trafficking, human trafficking. So there are certain indication, indicators they can use um, and also some of these hotels companies established um, an ethical hotline, an anonymous ethical hotline for employees to call if they suspect such activity. So it's one thing is are rooms in a hotel, for example, used for human trafficking. So that's one thing that people spot what sort of guests are checking in. And the other thing is indeed that um, there has been um, rings of human traffickers positioning people in um, receptionist positions, for example. So it's, it's quite remarkable how affected the industry is. So, and then co-workers would be encouraged to spot those signs and spot um, strange behavior or fearful workers or someone who gets picked up at work every day so who never leaves work alone who never comes out for any social events for example so there's certain indicators and i believe there's publications on that how to spot that so if you look at big hotel chains like um, um hilton fairmont you will find that they are married they all tackle this already so there's something we can learn from them that can be established in other organizations so a confidential hotline um, or an anonymous hotline is critically important. Um, we did have just one last question come in real quick from Dr. Mark. Um, Dr. Mark, I'm going to unmute you so you can ask, okay? 
Are you there? Okay. Yeah, I I have a challenge with my bandwidth, so I hope I really can make progress. That's why I typed a question there. So I hope you can just help me. Look oh, at the okay. question. Yeah. Sure, I'll ask it then. Um, the um, He wanted to know, are there policies that protect the dignity of refugees and displaced people who need to earn a living in host communities? Like what is I'm the sure, role of policy? I'm sure there are, but I'm afraid I'm not an expert in that particular field. So I'm that's a bit outside of my expertise, but I think I would look at UN level um, um, guidance for that. I can imagine there will be something or from the area of human rights, really. So I think that would be a human rights issue. Um, so I'm afraid I have no practical example of that. Okay, thank you. It does seem like an area where even locally pe the people could do regulations, right, to support the community. So. Yeah, I hope so, yeah. So um, we have two minutes left. I wanted to thank you for joining us today. This was great. I'm so glad we asked you to do, it, do this for us. <laughs> um, and I, like Elizabeth said, I wanted to know, you have any final thoughts before we call it a day? I really enjoyed this and um, yeah, thank you for inviting me. And if anyone wants to stay in touch, please do. Um, email me, you can connect on LinkedIn. I'd be more than happy to continue the conversation. Um, and thanks for your very inspiring questions. Great. So um, this concludes the August Lunch and Learn for Humanistic Management Professionals. Let me look at who we've got in September. Um, on August 25th, we have Lene Anderson from the Bildung Rose Group who will be our guest. So join us then.